In today's show, it's another ADP battle show with Alex Raclean of Rotowire. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today, we're doing another ADP battle, as I mentioned, with Alex Reclean of Roto. Why? I hope you guys have enjoyed the mock drafts. We've got some more mock drafts coming in the next couple of days as well. So let's uh, let's bring Alex in here and let's uh, let's talk ADP. You're on, you're on the air. You've got you've come you come straight through. We're ready to go. We're here to talk ADPs. Alex Raclean of Rotowire, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. It's good to have you here. You did this last year, and uh, in the end, when we went back and looked at the results of this, it ended up uh, an even split between us uh, with, with the results of this uh, ADP battle. We're going to go again with seven new pairs of players. Let's just go straight into it because at pick number fourteen, if Paul George and Jimmy Butler are both sitting there, you're taking Jimmy Butler. Why? Um. Well, I, I think that of the ones of the picks we're going to debate today, this is the one where we're, I think we're closest. Yep. Um, I don't have Jimmy that far above Paul, uh, Paul George, but I do have Jimmy higher. Um, Jimmy Butler has outperformed Paul George um, pretty much every year for the last five years, with the exception of um, Paul George's, you know, top five in the MVP rating uh, year. Um, I think that they both offer a lot of compliment they, they they both have sort of similar skill sets but i think that uh, i i like the situation with jimmy butler as the clear top dog i like the situation with jimmy butler um theoretically at least less likely to take some to, to take the rest games um and just the team sort of more built around him um and and those sort of almost external factors really drive me to prefer Jimmy Butler to Paul George, um, admittedly in what I think is a relatively close competition. Yeah, I don't think it's that far apart. Um, There are a couple of things I think that do work in Butler's favor. The assists uh, can be hard to find later in drafts and he gets more of them. His free throw volume is absolutely through the roof and that's a hard thing to influence as well. But you said that you think that, you know, you're going to have more confidence in Butler not resting. I think it's actually the other way around. Yeah, Butler is older and he's he's been a little bit more banged up throughout his career. Paul George, yeah, sat some games last year, but he doesn't have an injury this year. Like he's he's not like a, this is not a chronic problem. He entered last season with after dual shoulder surgery, played only 29.6 minutes per game. He's not going to play that few minutes this year. There is zero chance that he's playing under 30 minutes a night. And I think you give him those three extra minutes and he he beats Butler pretty comfortably. They were almost the same in terms of where they were last year in fantasy ranking. And that's with an extra four minutes a game for Butler. So even that up, and I reckon George gets the nod. So why do you think that, that George is going to sit more games than Butler? Um, I think that... I think that... Um... You know, it might be a little bit of hangover effect from what happened last year and the shoulder injury and, and still, um, you know, watching him, especially down the stretch and, and just eye test being, watching the games and questioning, uh, is his shoulder right? Um, and so I think that there, there might be some hangover, which that may not actually be the best reason. Uh but, no, but also, I'm glad you, I'm glad I, you brought that up there, Alex, because that's something that's going to happen. Is people are going to think, "Well, man, he hit the side of the backboard in a playoff game." Jimmy Butler led his team to the finals, therefore Jimmy Butler's better. And even if you're not, you're consciously thinking that, like that can subconsciously get into your head. It can get into anyone's head that's drafting. And the same absolutely. thing will happen with guys like Jamal Murray, Donovan Mitchell, Bam Adebayo. These guys you had great um, playoff runs versus guys that went out on a sour note that that might skew our biases with those guys. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I've got to be honest that that might be affecting me. I also do think that the race for that, that the race in the standings um, that the heat are going to be in is a little more competitive. I think it's more even 
than the race that the Clippers are going to be in. I, I think that even though the Clippers probably got a little bit worse this year, I do think, do think that they are still pretty clearly a top two seed. Um, and I think that there is some gap between them and the Lakers and everybody else. Um, and so I think they're going to have the ability to take some extra rests um, in a way that if the Heat are trying to lock down a top two seed or a top four seed, uh, I'm not sure they're going to have the same flexibility because I think that the top of the East is six deep and almost any order of those six teams is justifiable. Alex, you talk about you know, rests and teams needing to preserve that energy. If you are struggling to get through your day, Built Go is the energy gel that you need to help you break through that afternoon war, whether it's a mental fatigue, physical fatigue, whatever it is. Built Go is the healthy replacement for your energy drink. The energy is not fake. It's lasting and it's natural. It comes in easy to take one and a half ounce packages. Stick them in your briefcase, your desk drawer, your pocket, your golf bag, whatever it is you need. Built Go is the best workout gel on the market. Three delicious flavors, peanut butter, honey, chocolate, coconut, and chocolate mint. It combines energy gel with collagen protein. It's loaded with beta alanine, B3, B6, B12, honey, and some caffeine. And the collagen in there helps promote joint, soft tissue, hair, and skin health. The stuff literally makes you look better. So go to builtgo.com. Use the promo code LOCKED and you'll get 20% off your next order. The promo code is LOCKED for 20% off at builtgo.com. Let's go. And let's go here, Alex, on to the next one. And it's pick number 30, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who's probably not going to be around at pick 30 in most drafts. I'm not sure if you're seeing that trend with Shea. His ADP on Yahoo is 30 at the moment. That's why I've got him here. But he's going in the second round in a lot of spots. I'm taking Shea. But if Drew Holiday's on the board, you're taking Drew over Shea. Uh, sell me on that one. I think that you and the fantasy market at large are building in a little too much uh, growth for Shea. Um, That's fair I'm enough. not... And I'm just, I don't, it strikes me as a little too much, a little too optimistic and a little too, um, too much projection. He's a great player. He's a fun player to have on your team. Absolutely. Um, and I would be delighted if he lasted a little bit past this pick, which as you've pointed out, he isn't, but he was already playing 35 minutes a game last season and his usage rate rate was 24%. Um, there's not that much room for his usage rate to grow, go up. There's not that much room for his to come from his growth. And I think that playing next to Chris Paul helps a player's fantasy performance and that being gone, while it will lead to more opportunities for Shea, um, it will also make life harder for him. Uh, and so I, I just, I can't go from his 53rd ranking last year in nine cat to 30th. I can go to 40th, but I, I think that's too much of a leap. Um, and with Drew Holiday, we're oh, looking before at you go a into, guy Before we go into Drew, let me, let me just touch um, on Shay here for a yeah. second, Alex. Um, I agree with some of what you said there. Um, it will be harder for him. So I think he's going to suffer a, a dip in his field goal percentage because um, yeah, Chris Paul's not there. Uh, he's going to probably see his defensive numbers drop off, but... And I agree with you, there's no upside for minutes. Like, that's going to stay the same. But I think he's got usage upside. He loses not only Chris Paul, but Dennis Schroeder and Danilo Gallinari out of that team. So he's going to get a lot more shot opportunities. And I think you're going to see his assist rate as from being the third ball handling option to being the number one ball handling option. Might see his assist rate go back to similar to what it was with the Clippers or even his numbers in college. So I think he's got uh, usage upside and assist rate upside, even if the percentages and uh, defensive numbers might suffer a little bit of a hit. So that's why I've got him jumping up that far. But yeah, tell me about Drew Holiday, because you talk about minutes upside. I think Holiday's got minutes downside, because he goes from a team where he's playing 34, 35 minutes a night to a Budenholzer team that, mate, Mike Budenholzer would have a heart attack if he had to play anyone over 31 minutes a night. So I worry a little bit that bit with Drew there. And he was yeah, 35 a night, and he was the 31st ranked player last year. So how are you expecting him to get better? So the, I, I am a little bit worried about what three minutes less per game is going to do. Absolutely. Um, that is my biggest fear with Drew. Um, one of the things I did look at, though, when I was looking at Drew was I looked at what was um, Eric Bledsoe's usage rate when he left. So Eric Bledsoe, he was only playing 27 minutes per game. So that, so you know, th that is fewer minutes than, than Drew was playing and it's fewer minutes than Drew is going to play. But Bledsoe was averaging more than 24% usage um, and Drew was averaging only a little bit higher, 24.6% usage. So I, so assuming sort of 
a one for one flop, Drew is Drew's usage rate can stay the same roughly. Um, there, we're we're talking about a probable minutes hit, but we're probably not talking about a usage hit, and I think that that is helpful and relevant. Um, and and I look at Drew's finishes, um, not last year, but the two years before, of both being in the top twenty five. Um, I look at, I'm willing to boost a player a little bit for the assists in the early rounds. So if you are, you know, an elite passer and I'm expecting you to finish 35th overall, uh, I'm willing to draft you at 30th because assists are more scarce and there's that strategic advantage. Yep, I agree um, with that. So, so I, I, I think it's, it's sort of that hope that the usage stays the same, maybe even goes up half a t half a point, and that whatever um, lack of minutes is able to uh, maybe add an assist because he's working as a primary distributor. Who do you th I, I think this is a decent bet as well. Is it which one of these players averages more assists this year? Is it Drew or is it Shea? I would, I would assume Drew. Wouldn't you? No, no. I, I actually think it's the other way around. I think actually Shea is going to see you know, maybe six assists per game and Drew might be at five and a half. And you're right that Drew is going to move into a primary ball handling role, but Giannis is still going to have the ball tons and he's going to average a lot of assists there. So it's not like Drew is running a Ricky Rubio, Chris Paul type of scenario uh, as a point guard. Um, he's going to have to uh, you have DJ Augustin, who they'll share the court a little bit together. So DJ will have some of that ball handling. And we know Drew just doesn't want to be a point guard for whatever reason. He just doesn't want to do that. Um, and Chris Middleton handles the ball quite a bit, also. So th I think I think it's a, 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 a at the very worst a toss up, and I, I have uh, Shea projected at more assists than uh, than Drew at this point. Could be wrong on that, but Middleton's a, a, a decent assist player. Yanni gets him sure. as well. Uh, DiVincenzo can handle the ball there too. So there are some other options, and he doesn't come in as just the primary number one guy at all times because we we know how much that Antetokounmpo is going to have the ball in his hands there. Alex, let's go on to the next one. Pick number 40. Now, this is super exciting for me to hear you go all in on Al Horford. Al Horford, Zach Levine, they're both there. I'm taking Levine every day of the week because as you mentioned before, um, you're giving a boost to guys who get some assists and Levine does it with scoring and high efficiency and he gets some assists. Um, Al Horford, mate, he's older than me almost. What are, we, what, are we, what are we looking at here at Al Horford at number 40? Oh, I love Horford this year. I think he's going to have a 30, 40 spot bump. You're looking at him in like a 50 spot jump. And to me in the top 50, it's just not worth it. Um, in nine cat last year, he finished uh, inside, inside the top 70. So I'm not looking at that big a jump from last year. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, Horford... When you look at his contract, when you look at what the Thunder are doing, um, I think that this is a reclamation project very similar to what they did with Chris Paul, albeit with a lesser talent player. Um, but a guy who was in a situation that wasn't being used to his full skill set, um, who has some years left on his contract, that they want to put that they want to put him in a situation where he shows better so that they can turn around next off season and trade him for a good draft pick, just like they did with Chris Paul this year. Um, and I think we showed that the system works. And I think as you were just talking about with um, the Thunder's departures and the increased usage rate for, um, or, or opportunities for, for Shea, I think that there is a lot of opportunity for Horford. Um, and so I think that that is, I think that he's in a much, much better situation than he was in last year. Um, yes, age is an issue. Yes, injuries are an issue, but injuries aren't that big an issue. He has been pretty sturdy for most of his career. You know, you've got to go back a decade before you find uh, almost a decade before he played less than 65 games. Um, so there are some missed games, but he, he's relative. He's a relatively sturdy player, generally speaking, in terms of the health. Um, and again, in, you know, looking at assists, I really put a strategic premium on big men who can pass and Horford's averaged at least four assists per game, um, for several years. And you just almost, you just said that you're expecting Shai's assists to almost double. Um, I, I think it's reasonable to expect probably the next best passer on the team, maybe with Horford to see a boost from four to five or even five and a half, six. I think that's possible. Um, yeah. 
And so I think that there is that sort of strategic bump as well. And, and then finally, you know, last year was a down year, but the before that he was a top 50 player every season forever. And so, yes, age is going to knock down that upside. But um, we're it, we're talking about a guy with a long track record of top 50 performance. Yeah, look, he's awesome. Like, there's no, no d- debating that. And I think what's going to be interesting between these two players is that there is a real chance that Al Horford averages more assists than Zach Levine. But Zach Levine has a high field goal percentage than Al Horford, which is weird when you're considering <laughs> shooting guards versus centers. But I reckon that's a possibility that those two things yeah. could happen. Um, yeah, look, you're obviously valuing turnovers, which I do not give a shit about at all. You can have zero turnovers. And unless you're interested in drafting Marvin Williams, like I'm not, I don't really care about those turnovers. So I think that inflates yeah. the value of guys like Horford who might average 14 points a game, which is yeah, not that high. And you talk about the value yeah. of assists. The value of points is way more important in those early ones. That is, you cannot get scorers outside of the top 40 and Levine's going to be maybe a 25 point per game scorer, maybe 23, whatever it is. And Horford might get 13. So there's that's, that's a big differentiator to me, but I agree that Horford's going to be much improved and he's a great, great target. And his ADP of 94 is ridiculous. Um, I wouldn't be taking him inside the top 50, but I understand all those uh, arguments. I just think the value of Levine and his scoring, um, it, it tops it off for me to take him at number 40 there. Can I just jump in and would say one thing, um, which is the point about you have to pick high scorers early is is very much true. But I think it's actually becoming less true with the three point boom and with the way the league has been shifting over time. Um, Four years ago, you couldn't get a 20 point scorer outside of the top 40. And now they're rare, but they do exist. It's about about three or four of them, though. Who are they? Andrew Wiggins? Um, uh, Buddy Hill, well, Zion, Zion's Zion, ranking yeah. last year was Zion. was low, but he, that I don't know that that counts. Um, looking at it right now, uh, Kobe White yep. averaged twenty per game. Jamal Murray was outside the top forty, although his ADP was better than that. Jalen Brown was outside the top forty. Yep. Um, you know that the, yes, there are not that many, but they do exist in a way that they literally didn't exist. No, that's true. That, that, that's true. But when you look at the distribution of you know, the top, whatever, in each category, yes. points are like it's always at the top and it's always, you know, in three pointers is spread you know, well throughout rankings and rebounds are spread throughout rankings and percentage guys are spread more, but points is, is the one that's concentrated up the top. But let's go on to the next one because pick, pick number 22. Um, Russell Westbrook and Kyle Lowry are both on the board here, Alex. I would take Russell. At this point, I'd probably take him a little bit higher. I, I, the reports you know, from Scott Brooks, he's going to miss one game of back-to-backs. And a lot of people have been misinterpreting that. I had multiple people say to me, well, oh, Josh, he's going to miss both games of a back-to-back. Like, he's not going to miss both mm-hmm. games of a back-to-back. He's going to miss one of the two games. But uh, this is uh, this is not a surprise to me, Alex. This is what I expected from Russell Westbrook right. when I started my projections. He was going to miss back-to-backs. Cole right. Lowry's a million years old as well. So he's a guy that's had... Uh, injury issue, issues, maybe they rest him some games too. So I don't think that that's all that big of an advantage here for Lowry over Westbrook in this uh, in this argument. So what is your argument for Kyle Lowry over Russell Westbrook? So for the for the last two years now, I've just been afraid of drafting Russell Westbrook, um, and he has suffered a big penalty in my ranks as a result of that because. He is now 32. We're starting to see some injury wear up on a guy who oh, sure. was an Iron Man for years. And um, I think that just his specific mentality and his play style are the type that are going to. You know, he was so great because he was such an incredible, athletic, aggressive force. And I don't know that he has the mentality to be able to take those gifts and play at 80% and, and manage his skills so that he can survive a season. And I am just terrified that when it ends for Russell Westbrook, it's going to end badly and that it's going to end fast. We're, we've entered an era over the last decade plus where more and more stars are able to age gracefully. And I just... Russell Westbrook strikes me as an exception. I, I don't see his mentality allowing him to do that. I think at some point it's just going to be a disaster. And I am willing to take the fact that I might be drafting a worse player with a worse ranking to avoid being a part of that when that bill comes due. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing on this pick. Um, but I think one of these years he's going to go from top 30, top 40 
to barely top run 100 because his body can't do it anymore. Yeah, look, I think that's I think that is going to happen for Westbrook. I've got no doubt about that. I don't think it's going to be this year, but at some point it's going to be poor. Now, the encouraging thing I have for Westbrook is that towards the end of the season, he just figured he I don't know if he figured it out, if it was drummed into him or he accepted the reality that he can't hit threes, that he, that he can't do it. And he eight percent or nine percent of his shots in that post all star break period or in January onwards, whenever that period was, I can't remember the exact number, were from three. And he, overall for the season, 16% of his shots were from three, down from 28 the year before. And yeah, he'd been at 19 and 30 and 24 in previous years. If he gets that down to single digits, like 10% of his shots from three, then that field goal percentage doesn't hurt you. Um, the free throws, they were back up to 76 last year. So they didn't really hurt you. And that was the, the common thing. Oh, Westbrook, he kills your free throws. You've got to punt both categories. Well, last year, he actually didn't at all because he was at 47 and 76. And they are actually like bang on average numbers there. And there is going to be a problem with him at some point. Um... But I think him taking that step to realize, no, I cannot shoot threes because I'm bad at it. And actually accepting that fact made him awesome in that second half of the season. And that's why I've got some faith in him there. Lowry is three years older, three and a half years older, um, and has had injury problems. Let's see what they do. He's also weirdly, you know, we're, this has been recorded a few days before it's been released. He hasn't even been around the team. Uh, so I don't know what's going on with him at the moment. I don't yeah. know if he is ha having a COVID diagnosis, but he's just not there. So I don't know what he's actually going on with Larry. That's a little bit of a concern. Um, but I can totally understand avoiding Westbrook because of those concerns. I just think it's probably a little bit higher for Larry. And maybe you know, if there was other players in this mix, you'd take them there. But this is more just to I, say you know, who, who you would rather out of these two. That's fair. Just to, because I would completely focus my answer on the fact that I'm afraid of Russell Westbrook yeah. at this stage of his career. Just a couple words in Lowry's favor. You know, he has been top 40 for years. Oh, he's awesome. He was top 25 last year. Um, he is, again, you know, one of the top 10 ish players in assists per game. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think that picking him in the early 30s is a bad pick at all. No, that's exactly um, where it should be. At the end of the second, start of the third round is absolutely fine for him. Yeah. Um, last year, I got shit on for uh, for saying that Kyle Lowry was going to be the Raptors' best fantasy player because everyone was, you know, oh, Pascal Siakam, we've got to take him at number 12 or number 15. Uh, I think Larry again, is probably going to be their best best fantasy guy. Maybe it's Van Vliet. Uh, maybe Siakam takes a step up, but he's just consistently good. And yeah, this is not to say that I don't like Kyle Lowry because I obviously do. But it's just that I would take Westbrook ahead of him. The next one, pick 45. Darren Fox, Robert Covington. Love Robert Covington. I just don't want to pick him at number 45. We know what he did in Houston. They were awesome numbers. He was like a top 20-ish sort of player in that Houston run. But let's let's get to it, Alex, because he is not in Houston anymore. Do you think he plays those 34, 35 minutes a night? He was almost functionally the center on that team. That's why his block numbers went through the roof. And he will not functionally be the center in Portland. So I am digging him some block numbers. I just think their forward rotation is deep with Jones and Mallow and Hood all coming off the bench or starting next to him that might take two to three minutes away from Covington. So sell me on Covington, who I love as a player. I just, I'm not sure that he's going to be able to live up to what he did last year. Um, I think... What you're saying makes some sense. Um, and, you know, part of picking Covington is he's a guy who's going to help you in turnovers, which your strategy, which is a reasonable strategy, um, is, is to not pay any attention to yep. turnovers. Uh, at Rotowire, we'd still include those in our, you know, sort of normal, um, as our sort of default when we're writing. Um, but, I, I think that, you know, even going back to his years in Philly, you know, now two years removed, he was playing 32 minutes a game and inside the top 40 in terms of nine, nine cat finish. So there is some track record of that. Um, and he's just one of those completely boring, safe floor players who I feel very confident is going to get me 12 points, two threes, you know, maybe the rebounds do go down to five rebounds a game, but he, you know, he will give me some steals. He will give me some blocks. One of the things I like, and it, one of the things I like is that um, his field goal percentage has improved over the last three years. Um, you know, for a couple of years back around the middle of the decade, he was one of the biggest drains in field goal percentage in the league. And, you know, even on, a really shaky Tim Timberwolves squad. Granted, it was in a bridge season. Um, you know, he got that up to a passable 43%. 
Uh, so I, I think that that helps. And I think that the argument that he is going to have a hard time getting power forward minutes um, compared to what he was playing in Houston is very valid. But he, uh, I, th I think it was his first year in Philadelphia, maybe his second, uh, he played more minutes at shooting guard than he did at small forward or power forward. So he is a versatile player. Yes, he's better suited to a big small forward or a small power forward position. I'm not disagreeing with that. But he is versatile enough to play other positions. And the fact that he was, you know, seemingly the the main thing that the main player that the Trailblazers went to go bring in tells me that like they do want to incorporate him. And skills wise, I think he is their best wing. Um, so I so I don't that. the minutes will probably I, I'm not worried about the minutes taking too big a hit. Yeah, look, the, I think he's still going to play his 30 plus. I'm just not sure he's going to play the D'Antoni 34, 35s. And the the worry that I have again is just having you know, him not being the primary rim protector because that's going to be Yusuf Nurkic. Does that just cut mm -hmm. some of those block opportunities, which is what really vaulted him right up last year? So I think, guess this is just, I, I like Covington. I think he's a fine mid round guy, but I'm just pretty big on Darren Fox. Now, his free throws are, are poor, but the big assists, the high scoring, uh, really good steal numbers. What. What are you souring on Darren Fox? Or what, what is it that you're yes. a little bit down on here? So I can tell me, <laughs> tell me what it is. Um, I so the Kings, the Kings coaching staff, oh, the yeah, Kings that's organization true. terrifies me. Um, and you, a player suffers a 10 point drop in my ranks just when I see SAC next to their name. Um, you know, in in nine cat, which is sort of what I do my default rankings in. Um, he, he was 70th two years ago and 82nd last year. Um, you know, he was considerably higher in ACAT. Do you have his ACAT? Yeah, 55. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot better and that certainly, um, helps. I do expect him to do better than he did last year. I do expect some improvement. Um, he had that grade three ankle sprain last year as well, which obviously yeah. impacted what he was doing during the year. Yeah. But just the, the King's factor terrifies me. And when I'm looking at you know, that late fourth, that sort of late fourth round, it's an area of the draft that I just don't love. And so I would rather what I feel is the sort of, you know, quote, safety of someone like Robert Covington um, over, uh, you know, the volatility of the Kings, um, even for sort of a much more fun player like the Aaron Fox. And, you know, as we're noticing probably a theme with my picks, um, having Horford higher, having Covington higher, uh, I do like low scoring players. Um, my favorite punt build is punt points. It is a good uh, one. I think there's a ton of value in that build. And so player low scoring players do tend to creep up my rankings in particular because of that. Um, so, yeah. All right. Next one. We're in that same sort of fourth round, fifth round type of area. Pick number 43. I discussed this player with Jared Johnson a couple of days ago. That's Kelly Oubre Jr. So I've picked 43. Kelly Oubre is on the board. Ja Morant is on the board. I'm taking Ja every single day of the week. Um, getting scoring and getting assists, you know, a 20 and 8 guy is super value for me. High field goal percentage for a guard. Yes, he's going to be low in steals. He's not great there. He's going to be low in threes, but just that assists, the points, he can rebound. He can give you some solid enough percentages. I am taking Jar every day here at this spot. Spot now. I talked quite a bit about Ubre with Jared the other day. I'm just a little bit worried, maybe, about how the usage goes and where he is in the pecking order with the Warriors, with Wiggins and Curry, and how that all fits in. Um, yeah, how his percentages look because they're they're never superb. So yeah, you know, he sold me on Ubre. I want you to sell me on why you'd have Ubre over Morant. Um, I was looking through our notes, and Ubre was one of the players that I actually argued for on this show last year. Um, <laughs> so did, it's kind of right. funny that, um, you know, back to back, I'm, I'm trying to pitch for Ubre. Um, I still like the situation is a thing that's worth just calling out right away. Um, I think that uh, the, I think that where he is going to slot in um, on the Warriors, especially with Clay Thompson out, he's probably going to be their second option offensively. Um, almost certainly going to be their second option offensively is certainly a better player than Wiggins. Uh, he certainly um, is, but does Andrew Wiggins know that? <laughs> um, um, and so I, I think that recreating something like his 22 usage rate and his 34 minutes from Phoenix last year 
helps, you know, when I'm looking at players, I do look at the point guard next to and going from uh, Chris Paul to Steph Curry as your primary facilitator, not a downgrade there. So he's still going to get that kind of, um, he wasn't with uh, Chris Paul. He was with Devin Booker uh, and Ricky Rubio. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I, I went back in time and put Chris Paul on the team, um, but R- Ricky Rubio, not quite the same uh, shot uh, shooter, but still a very good passer. Um, so, you know, maybe a, an improvement in sort of being less of the fo- the focus of defensive attention. Um, and I, I like the, I like his sort of versatile stat profile. I, I like that, um, you know, he can get not quite a block. He can get kind of close to a block a game and that he provides um, sort of help pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm a big fan of his. And with John Morant, similar to with, with Shy, I, I'm afraid that you are assuming too much growth. Uh, another great, fun player with an incredibly promising future, but picking him this high, are you assuming more um, development year to year than uh, is fair? He averaged 18 and 7 last year, and I've got him at like 21 and 8. So it's three points and one and half an assist per game, pretty much. So I've got him going up. That's um, reasonable, yeah. Which I, I, don't, I don't, and look, I'm not ever actually anticipating much in terms of percentage growth because he was so good in the field goal percentage last year. So it's just really yeah. looking at him. And I think the main thing for me for Morant, he played 31 minutes a night last year. I think they're going to just fully let him go and play 34 and give him three extra minutes. I think he can score three yeah. extra points. And that's that's what that's the jump there for me with Moran. I think that's, to me, that's a pretty straightforward. And that's not even including like an increase in steals or threes or efficiency or anything like that. It's like play three more minutes, um, score three more points, and there you are. And that, that's that's my argument for Moran. That's, that, that to me is a simple one, is that they just won't hold him back. Because he was coming off that knee injury at the start of last year, we remember. And they were really, really careful with him. And they're not going to mm-hmm. be anymore. Well, they're going to be careful, but you know they're not going to be like, oh, we need yeah. to make sure you play 29 minutes. And they're not going to do that. They're going to, <laughs> they're going to let him go bananas, like they did in the bubble where he was playing some really, really big minutes. The last one, Alex, get you out of here. Pick 85. This is a theme here. I'm liking young point guards, and you're liking old, banged-up veterans. Number 85, <laughs> Killian Hayes, Blake Griffin. Now, Killian Hayes has got the job at starting point guard. He's had a couple of rough preseason outings. Blake Griffin has looked really spry. He's looked good, even though the shot's not going in for Blake. The the argument here, before you even say it, is that you know, Killian Hayes is a rookie point guard and they're bad and Blake Griffin's a veteran. And my argument is, yes, Blake Griffin's a veteran, but he gets hurt. So is there anything different in that argument? <laughs> um, two, no, but two nuances to it that I'd just like to throw out. Um, one is when we're talking about the 85th to 90th pick, which is, I think, sort of the high end almost of where Blake's going. I just don't think that that pick factors in the upside of Blake Griffin. It, I feel like that that pick that ADP is only focused on the fact that he's old and he has a lot of injuries, valid critiques. But if he plays, how, how does his per game value, how is his per game value below 75? And I think that that's being really conservative. Missed games is a huge factor. If he's not playing, that's a huge problem. But there is the chance that he plays uh, you know, 50 out of six uh, or 60 out of 72 games. Yep. And if he does, you've got an incredible steal there. And I think when you're talking about a pick this late, there's just so much upside there. Um, and with Killian Hayes, it's not just rookie point guards. It, it's not just rookie point guards, but it's rookies in general. Um, uh, you know, one of my sort of corners that I've been on for years is that drafting a rookie inside the top 100 is a bad bet because pretty much every year going back as long as I've tracked this, which is um, to the Kevin Durant draft 2007, um, we picked the wrong rookies to finish in the top 100. Um, We, the fantasy community, if you compare ADP to which rookies finish in the top 100, eight cat or nine cat, we get it wrong almost every year. Um, There's usually about two rookies per season who finish in the top 100 and, you know, about um, one ro- one rookie every two years is the one that we expected to finish that high. Um, and so I love drafting rookies late and I hate drafting rookies early because some of them are going to hit and I don't trust us. I don't trust we, the scouting community, to get it right. Yeah, look, the rookies are, are, are tough to peg. And this one, I'm, I'm not as you know aggressively saying that I would take you know, Hayes over, over Griffin. Um, 
but you mentioned yeah on on if he plays like where's Griffin going to be ranked? Is it going to be higher than this? Uh, do you remember where he ranked last year on a per game basis? Uh, <laughs> this is, 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 is a good number. It's a good number. Two hundred fifty ninth. Yeah, uh, three hundred and thirty second. If you're looking at nine cat. Yeah, oh, Jesus, that, that's worse. Um, yeah, because the, sh- the shots just w- they wouldn't go in. He played twenty eight minutes a night. He couldn't hit anything. His rebound numbers fell off a cliff. He's never a bit of steals and blocks guy. I think a lot of that will, will come back, and the shooting won't be anywhere near as rough as what I think it was like twenty something percent on threes. It's not going to be that bad. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was pretty rough from him last year, and he's looked really good in the preseason. He's going to get a lot of assists. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm fine with Griffin at this spot really, and the Hayes one. I just think. The upside in his assist numbers uh, are interesting, but I I'd actually don't have too much of a problem with this one. I just thought it was interesting to get a discussion on two guys on the same team uh, who are obviously opposite ends of their career, um, and we'll, we'll see how... I hope Blake stays healthy. He's, so, he's such a yeah. good player, and he's such a good bloke, and he's he's unbelievable to watch when he's going, and he's been really fun even in these preseason games, even though the shot hasn't necessarily fallen for him. Uh, so, look, that's that's an interesting one there. Pick 85, I'm absolutely no problem. We're getting Blake Griffin there. Alex... I reckon that might wrap us up here. Um, tell everybody what you do and where they can find you if they want to get in contact and uh, ask you questions. Yeah, find me on Twitter. My uh, handle is my last name, Rickleen, R-I-K-L-E-E-N. Um, I, most of my stuff shows up on RotoWire uh, and you know, tweet up everything else. Go and follow Alex over there if you don't already. Alex, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. All right, and that will do it for today. Don't forget, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube, guys. Give it that five-star review. Give it the thumbs up. Leave a comment. All of those good things, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.